Welcome to episode 4 of the Collect a Hobby podcast. Today we interview the creator for Yokaishi TCG, so stay tuned. You collect video games, and you collect trading card games. Welcome to your new home, and welcome to one of the most unique podcasts ever. This is the Collect a Hobby podcast. We've been collecting for years, and we're up to date on all the latest trends in the hobby. Our website, collectahobby.com, is a social network for collectors, made by collectors, made by collectors, for collectors. Welcome to your new family. This is the Collect a Hobby podcast, and now, your expert hosts, Hector and Rich. Let's get this party started. What? What? Sounds fun. Wear your helmets. Welcome back to another episode of the Collect a Hobby podcast. Today we have a special guest by the name of Steph, and Steph is going to introduce his trading card game today. And I'm really excited about this. So let's just start off by saying, How are you doing today, Steph? How's everything going? Doing real good. I am glad to be here. I'm, I'm, we're glad to have you here. And so I guess we'll get started into questions right away. So the first thing we want to talk about is what is your trading card game called? And what made you decide to create a trading card game to begin with? Yes, uh, my trading card game is called Yokai Shi TCG. And what made me make it was uh, back in 2020, uh, when New York City was about to go into shut uh, lockdown, I should say. I was already planning what I wanted to do during that time. Originally, I was going to go back into making comics, I thought, because I took a hiatus from it. And um, when the lockdown actually happened and I was just sitting through it, I was like, you know what? I don't feel like making a comic. <laughs> I don't feel like it. So I was like, okay, I want to do something else. And I actually wanted to make a game, like an actual video game, because before in the past, I've dabbled with RPG Maker. You know, so I was like, I want to make a game, but I didn't want to make a whole ass RPG because <laughs> uh, that's a lot of work. A lot and, of work. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I thought, okay, maybe I'll make a card game, something similar to like Duel Links or something like that. Well, I am, uh, I am an old school guy. I'm a traditionalist, so I might as well just make the cards myself, make it a whole TCG. It started when I was like looking online. I was looking at like how to make cards yourself, like physically. And that's when I discovered the homemade TCG community. And I've stumbled upon many different videos from many different creators and they have their own little techniques. And then through there, I discovered the Game Crafter. Have you heard of the Game Crafter? Yes. Yes. I actually heard about it after I found out that you created this game. And it's a place that allows you to create different games and things like that. Yes, yes. So yeah, when I discovered that, it got me thinking and I was like, you know what? Instead of like doing it by hand 100%, I can, you know, make make my thing look kind of professional, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the type of guy that when I am about to start a project, a creative venture, I look at all the resources I have before me and I try to see what's the most I can get out of what's available to me? You know what I'm saying? And, and from that point on, I was like, well, I'm stuck at home for a while, so I might as well commit. And here we are. Yokai Shi TCG <laughs> became a thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I guess you kind of answered our second question, but we were going to ask, so did you create the art and did you pull inspiration from any other trading card games or animes? Oh, yeah. yes, I made the art. Like, the art is like, 99% me. <laughs> the card framing, the actual like creature designs and art, uh, the packaging as well, everything. <laughs> Yokaishi TCG is a one man crew. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me. I would say, yeah, anime definitely inspired me. I would say Yu Gi Oh would be my, my starting inspiration or foundation for it. That's my game, by the way. Just like, just throw it out there. You go. So I, I agree with you on that. When I was actually getting into like the homemade TCG community, and I was thinking back to the days when you know I was in 
you know, elementary school and junior high school, and I used to buy card packs and all that other jazz. And I saw the Game Crafter provided that experience for people. So I was like, yeah, you know, I want to do that too. So, <laughs> so, so like I kind of started following like the, the Yu-Gi-Oh model a little bit in terms of like how I've been like designing my booster packs and almost how I'm kind of like releasing the cards and all that other jazz. So yeah, in a sense, Yu-Gi-Oh is a big influence in terms of what got me started. As far as what made me decide the theming. So like, yes, I like anime, but I'm also a general like nerd for Japanese culture. I really like Japanese folklore. And when I was thinking about what to make my game about, I figured I would do yokai because they're practically like public domain. You know what I'm saying? There's so many of them. <laughs> and I was like, if I'm going to make a card game, I want something that's not going to take me a million years by myself. So I was like, yokai was a good fit because they already exist. I, there's, there's plenty of reference to go off of. So I was like, all right, yokai it is. <laughs> That's cool. So I guess since you actually did all this now, right? Anytime you create any type of game, whether it's a board game, a video game, or in this sense, a trading card game, there's always stages or multiple levels to the game. Meaning that from funding to creating the art, to creating the gameplay, to finally marketing the game, what was your biggest challenge between all those stages of creating the game? Hmm. The biggest challenges, <clears throat> I would say when I was actually making the game, the biggest challenge was like developing it, the rules and how it's played. Like that was a big thing. The drawing, making the art is easy. That's easy beans, you know? <laughs> I, I knocked out all the artwork in like six months, <laughs> but I spent a majority of the lockdown actually thinking about how do I want this game to play? How do I want it to feel? Uh, I looked at a lot of videos of like, oh, making your own trading card game. And, you know, I looked at videos of other TCGs to be like, okay, how does this play? How is that? You know, I try to see like, what do I like? What can I add to my game and all that other jazz? So in the creating process, that was the hardest part at first. Um, and after that is uh promotion <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know promoting getting a fan base um i would say if you do it through the homemade tcg community it's a little bit easier just because it's a small community but it's sizable enough to where if you put yourself in there people will find you because there's plenty of people looking for you know independent slash homemade tcgs or board games and all that other jazz so that's a good start it's just when you start to break out past that it gets very hard very hard yeah i mean i think we can relate because uh with collectahobby.com the website itself it was already hard to do certain things for the website to make it a social network for people that love to collect trading card games and also video games but the next phase is now promoting the website, right? So that became like its own task. Uh, I know you have to enjoy the moment. Cause I know that's the hardest part is to bring people to the site, but you have to believe once you bring people there that they're going to actually like your product, right? At the end of the day, that's what you want to believe that you think that if someone's going to play my game, they're going to actually enjoy it. And that's what pushes you to keep going, you know? Yes, yes. A step. How did you fund the game and, and get it off the ground? Yes, well, I funded the game pretty much out of pocket. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say, well, funny enough, luckily for me, how I made the game, it wasn't too expensive. It did make the majority of it during lockdown when money was tight. So, so believe it or not, it was a lot of it was just free, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, because it was just like I did a lot of the artwork, the packaging. Um, I did everything, everything I could do myself. I did myself. Um, and the only thing I really paid for was the mock-ups, the, the test prints of the cards. So I lucked out there. It took the very like independent route of doing everything myself. I was like, you know, I think I can get far with with my own ingenuity and i and i, I did <laughs> 
so I think that's pretty cool the the way you're able to do it on your own, especially you know you took advantage of the lockdown to work on something that you wanted to work on something you had fun with and that was probably the best thing to take advantage of the extra time that you may have had now a question i have though is have you been able to market this game at all have uh, any conventions or any expos have you done anything like that yet i haven't done anything like that yet but i i want to actually yeah uh, i i said to myself like um i wanted to do it at least after i get out the next set because <laughs> i feel like the next set will make it a more um complete deck building experience i guess is the best way i could put it so, so when you say like, deck building experience you mean like uh balancing like it'll be it'll help you with the balancing and everything or what the balancing and also help with the flow of gameplay but in terms of making it a more complete uh deck building experience i felt like set one i kind of made it as like the introductory set it's like easing people into to where I want the game to get, like one step at a time approach. Set one has a very simple gameplay with sprinkles of some uh, like complex game moves that you can do through the effects just to foreshadow what's coming in the future. You know what I'm saying? There were definitely some cards I held off from putting into set one. I want people to play the game first. And I wanted to keep it slow for now before I start adding cards that like really start speeding things up. So, yeah. W one thing, though, to make a suggestion, since you haven't gone to any conventions or expos, try to go something a little local, maybe something that's really small and see if you can get like a small table or something. This way, one, it wouldn't cost you as much, right? And mm. start out there to just to introduce it to people and just let them actually see what the game is and maybe just do... a one table and let people play on that table and just show them how to play the game and it's just you teaching people how to play the game and spreading the word about the game mm -hmm. so i think that would be something that would be good for you is just to go start out small and then you could definitely jump into a bigger convention after you already have some experience doing in the smaller ones because i think it's a lot easier to handle it on your own because once it gets the bigger ones and it, it's intimidating i think but <laughs> i not that you can't handle it. i think you can handle it but it might be good to just start out something cheaper for now of course yeah yeah good advice definitely definitely yeah i'll definitely look in to see if there's any like local places i can demo the game and teach people yeah for sure yeah because trust me I'm not out here looking to like drop hundreds of dollars just like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> so, so sticking with the gameplay, what would you say the hook for your trading card game is and what, what makes it different than other TCGs out there? I think back at, you know, what did I like about car certain card games when I was younger? I was like, okay, I like the simplicity and this and that. So I added different elements. With my game, I'd say, think of it as like Yu-Gi-Oh! with elements of Pokemon, the game slash anime, not the card game. Okay, gotcha. With elements of board placements. Mm. The, the monsters have elements, typing, they're super effective hits. Mm. However, they could only be activated in certain places on the board, so... Switching your creatures to different places in order to get off those effects to get an advantage on your opponent is a part of the game. I saw that there's like limbs, right? Which yeah. that alone to me is it's pretty cool. It's funny because when I was showing Rich, the first thing you mentioned, Rich, is this is cool. This reminds me of like Exodia or something like yeah. that. To put it together to <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, that's awesome. And I know it's not necessarily like Exodia, but just the fact that to, to put things together. And each of them had their own reactions. Some of those cards have their own traits that you can activate from it. I thought that right there definitely makes it different from a lot of other TCGs. Yeah, that was something I was thinking about way during the conceptual stages. When I commit myself to a project, I really think about it. And I was like, okay, because trust me, I was thinking about this for weeks, my boys. <laughs> <laughs> for literally weeks. Oh, yeah, I completely forgot about this. I remember this now. Another reason what helped me come up with this body limb gameplay mechanic was I actually thought of lore for the game. <laughs> me being an anime nerd, I had scenes playing out in my head and I was like, okay, how can I translate this into a card game? So once I came up with the lore, 
a lot of the design aspects fell into place. Okay. That yeah. is pretty cool. So, so, all right, continue on with this. So far, mm -hmm. I've seen you have like different types of starter decks. One's like an earth type and also mm -hmm. a lightning type. And mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, is it pronounced Raiju? Yeah, Raiju, yep. Okay, and that's the lightning type. Are you going to create any more star decks that are expanding around like different elements? Since one's earth type, the next one's lightning type, are you going to try to use more base off elements? Of course. Originally, way back in the conceptual stages, kind of like a Pokemon thing was like the gym leader decks. So I thought like when I released my game, it would be cool to like have not just some booster packs, obviously, but also kind of starter decks to get people going. I was also thinking about like theming for the starter decks and what to go by. And then I started thinking about the lore of my game and I came up with the idea of elemental masters. They'll be like these avatars that help me create the theming for the deck. So there, there will definitely be other elemental like starter decks. The earth deck is, uh, I would say very like defensive, very tanky, a very tanky deck. You know, um, I've struggled against that deck. So <laughs> my friend has made good use of that deck. He surprised me with that one. I'm, I'm generous with the cards you get in that deck. So there are some pretty like tanky fellows in that deck. And the lightning deck is more aggressive because it allows you to bring out stronger cards easier. I would say also very a very active agile deck because depending on how you play the, there's opportunities for switching, which is a mechanic in the game, switching from limbs to limbs, that sort of thing. So yeah, so Earth is, as you would expect for an Earth deck, very sturdy, very tanky. Lightning is very powerful and aggressive. Great. And uh, well, I guess to continue on with that starter deck, is that like ready to go? Like when you get a starter deck, that's good enough to start playing right there. Do you need anything else additional or is the starter deck good enough? The starter deck is good right away because uh, in, in the starter decks, you get 36 cards, like preset, like the, the element that it's meant for and a booster pack inside the box. Oh, uh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, so it's a good deal. You get the deck plus a booster pack inside the box. So you open the pack, the booster pack, and you, whatever pull you get, you might want to add to that deck as well. So I try to make it, ah, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to give to people, you know what I'm saying? I like that. It's always good yeah. to give right there. So, <laughs> so no complaints from me. <laughs> oh, definitely. So speaking of people playing together, do you see this more as a competitive game or more friendly, casual? How do you view it and how do you think people will take to it once they start learning it and playing it? Well, uh, let's see. I say it has the potential to be both casual and competitive because once again, Yu-Gi-Oh! is kind of like the base inspiration. I find it hard to believe that it wouldn't become competitive at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. There's going to be some people that might be like, oh, I can optimize my gameplay by putting these cards together or do this or do that. It, I feel like it's going to naturally happen, but definitely like casual play is just fine. I'm not trying to like scare people off play the game how you want to play it you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. gotcha. that's good so i guess since 2020 right a mm -hmm. lot of games have came out and one thing that's been happening is there's been games that have been focused on players and games has been focused for collectors and there's games that are for both for this mm -hmm. game that you created do you think it's more for collectors players or both i would say that it's for both. When I was creating the game, when I reached into the drawing stage and I had most of the designs worked out and that's when I launched the YouTube for the game. When I started showing the cards online, like doing like, like blog style stuff, a lot of people really liked the artwork for it. There were people that said they would just get the cards just for the artwork. Like I also designed my, my cards with an aesthetic in mind. So a lot went into the visuals as well so it's definitely good for players and collectors so, so since the game's for collectors is there different rarities and are there like cards that are harder to pull than others and do you have holographic cards as well yeah so um i do not have official holographics yet uh because okay. uh the game crafter as it stands right now they don't make holographic cards which is which is a bummer i would have liked that but I understand the, you know, profit margins, et cetera, et cetera. 
I'm sure in the future I will look into getting holographic cards. I played around with the idea because I've actually made holographic cards myself <laughs> just to kind of toy around with like, how would they how how they would look. And I figured like since I'm still in the homemade community, like I know the people who like homemade TCGs would be very interested in the homemade hollows. I am looking into making official hollows to put into booster packs and such. And I do have rarities uh, for the cards. I look at my resources and see what's available. So since the game crafter cannot make hollows, I'm like, well, then the rarities are just going to have to be based off of gameplay. So like the higher rarity cards are like the very strong cards. So we have common, we have uncommon, we have rare, and we have super rare. In the super rare category, you can find your god cards. <laughs> you can find your god cards, which are kami, because uh, the game is based off of yokai and, you know, old medieval folklore monsters, Shinto, and that, all that jazz. And also, there are shinies as well. <laughs> Those are definitely hard to pull, because yeah, they're in the super rare, and some are hidden in the rare as well. Um, but yeah. Okay, so I'm going to paint you a little picture right now. Mm -hmm. I am a brand new person, never heard of her game before. I just listened to this podcast and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I want to try to play this game. Mm -hmm. What is the best way for someone to start playing this game today? Uh, the videos, because in the battle videos, I actually narrate out loud every move that I do, every play like every phase just so that people who are watching or following along and learning as the action is going on. So definitely tutorial videos, battle videos to learn and to see it played and to decide for yourself if you really want to try it. And if you really want to try it, but you're not sure if you want to spend the money, you can go to the DeviantArt page. All right. All right. Check this out. Check this out. You can go to the DeviantArt page. And you can actually print out mock versions of the cards yourself and mess around with it. Mess around with it. I have all of set one uh, and some cards of set two, just to make it a more complete deck building experience, on the DeviantArt page that you can print out yourself. Consider this like the trial version for the game. Print oh. it out, play it, and see how it feels. Full instructions are also on DeviantArt and the Discord. A lot of information is on the DeviantArt. If you wanted to see the pages of the manual, it's right on Discord. That That's awesome, man, because I know a, a lot of TCGs are, there's a big like entry point and a lot of people are intimidated or scared. And the fact that you have tutorials and you're even allowing people to print out your cards and try it for themselves, I, I don't think I've even heard of anybody doing that. That's such a great idea. So. <laughs> Let's say I print it out, I play the game, I'm like, you know, I really like this game. I want to actually purchase this. Where would I go to purchase this game? Yes, right now you can find everything Yokaishi on the Game Crafter. They print and package my stuff, so right now they're the ones to go to. I have links. I have links on all of my uh, platforms that takes you directly to the pages for Yokaishi cards, or you can go to the Game Crafter and put Yokaishi TCG in the search engine and it'll pop up and that's where you'll find them. All right, that's cool. So just want to let you know right now, I would like to challenge you. I'm going to mm -hmm. learn how to play this game. I want to challenge you to an actual game. Like we'll just play it. We'll actually record it, right? We'll do something where you record on your phone on your side. I'll make sure I'm streaming on this side. We'll actually record it just to have fun. And I'm going to try to learn the game. I'm actually going to purchase the game. I don't know which starter deck I'm going to use, but I'm going to use one of your starting decks and we're going to actually try to play this game. So I don't know if that sounds like fun to you, but for me, I would like to actually <laughs> learn this game and see what I could do, how much damage I could do. Probably to myself. Not going to lie. But let's just pretend that I may do well. Who knows? If it makes you feel better, I taught my friend. He's gotten pretty good at the game. He's beaten me a few times, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if he has a, if he can learn the game quick, who can learn the game quick? You know what I'm saying? In fact, that's another compliment I get from my game is the fact that people are like, it's fast and easy to learn and that um, it's fun to, it's fun to play. So I think you can do pretty well. 
I think you'll do pretty well. <laughs> I love how he said, I think you'll do pretty well. He didn't say, I think you'll win. I think you'll do pretty well. <laughs> but I'll take it. I'll take that. <laughs> well, hey, listen, I always give people, I always give people a chance. That's it. I'm going to be trained every day. You have no idea. After this, I'm going to actually read up, try to get the instructions, the full instructions of this game. And we're going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out a way to play you and hopefully beat you. Would you be able to give us maybe a sneak peek of your upcoming deck, maybe a new element, and, and how oh, yes. that plays? Oh, yeah. So uh, the starter decks I am working on right now is yeah. Fire okay. and Nature. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm going with, like, opposites and opposing forces. The other featured element for set two, like... Uh, uh, Rich knows me from my wrestling days so if you think about it, you got your main event you got the fire and the nature and coming up in the middle is I would say the unofficial ice type <laughs> okay. yeah or more so like the snow type because uh, there's a subset of yokai in folklore the Yuki Ona so the snow woman and, and so I created an archetype around the snow women of folklore because there's several different types of snow women so so you got in set two come in fire nature and snow oh wow that's very exciting so mm -hmm. i actually have another question since we're talking about these starter decks mm -hmm. so the starter decks right now is there any way you could expand to it like you keep it as a base and maybe there'll be more cards you could add to it to make it a stronger deck than it is initially um, or is that something you plan in the future? Because there's certain card games like Vanguard. Like Vanguard is a type of game that over time they keep adding so you could make your starter deck a little bit better. And you, you have the base, but you can keep adding to it. Is this something that either you have now or you're thinking about in the future so someone can expand upon the original starter deck to add more to it? Yes, yeah. Definitely because like the way I see it, the more sets I put out, the more cards I add, there will definitely be cards that come out that will synergize well with the current starter decks that are out and the ones that are coming out in the future. I purposely designed cards that work with like a wide range of other cards. I didn't get super specific. Like for example, how in Yu-Gi-Oh! they have super specific cards. Yeah. <laughs> they could have a polymerization card for just one archetype. And I'm like, but you already have polymerization. You don't need this one specific. Correct. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not doing that. I'm not making it like that super specific -y thing unless it's folklore related. I, I'm pulling from folklore, taking some creative liberties without totally like making it too, like what's the best way to put it? Making it too, too over the top anime ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try to make it like uh, more broad because I feel like it's also better for the consumer. You know what I'm saying? This card can work for many other cards rather than worry about getting this one specific thing, you know? Yeah, that's smart. It's always smart to, to make it a little broader because you never know what route you're going to take. Because as you go on to different sets, if you keep doing multiple things, you may come back to something original and it's funny because you bring up Yu-Gi-Oh and Yu-Gi-Oh does that a lot right it's mm -hmm. like cards that you thought have no use anymore or anything like that it, it actually later on it may be useful for a new set or new cards that come out all mm -hmm. of a sudden people go back to find those cards and now use it so they could play in Yu-Gi-Oh and I, I think if you leave it open where it's not too specific you always have room to come back to in the future with other cards and other sets yeah and then also if I need to I can always go back and and make changes. I've I've done that a few times as well recently. I've had to change the text on certain cards and do some edits and all that other jazz. Oh, that's true. That's part of balancing and that, that's definitely going to happen. I can see that happen in the future. <laughs> oh, yeah. As more people play the game, like, I encourage people, play the game. Try to break it so I can fix it, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Me and my friends are, are how we're playing it now. It's functional just by how we're playing it. But I know, like, everyone plays differently, even if they're playing within the rules. They might try a unique play that I've never even thought of. And if that's the case, they can contact me and be like, and because, hey, I'm the creator and I'm pretty easy to contact. So I'll be like, hey, I did this play. 
is this cool? Is this like a, can this be like a legit ruling? And I'll be like, uh, and I'll look into it and then really think it over and be like, I'll say yay or nay. And also another thing is with Yu-Gi-Oh! and other companies as well, like they're big time companies. They trying to hit profit margins. I get it. I'm just one guy. I started this as a hobby. So I'm less concerned about the money right now. I'm more concerned about people getting their hands on the game and playing it. You know, like I, I work a full time job. I get a paycheck already. I'm not worried about putting food on the table, <laughs> you know. Um, so right now this is more of a passion project It's more for fun. So th that's why I that's why I have no problem really making a free version of the game. Like go, you know, print it and play it. And while you're playing with the mock cars, if you find a flaw, you tell me. And then, you know, because right there, you didn't even spend any money. And you just found something that needed fixing and you just made the game better. Even though you're only one person, I'm sure you're probably more reachable than Konami. It's like, I can't reach Konami. Be like, hey, what does Pot of Greed even do? Like, it's not like I just go there and ask them. Like, they're not, they're not going to respond back to that. <laughs> I, I know. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's funny. And I, and I think that's the best part about the homemade TCG scene because a lot of it is just, it's just one person just making a whole ass TCG, you know? Uh -huh. and, and a lot of them are just easy to reach, you know? They just you go to their Instagram, hit them up, or you go to their YouTube, you, you hit them up. And they, of course, they're all regular people with lives, so they'll get back to you when they get back to you. Uh -huh. But I see that's the good part is where in that community, we can have a connection with our players and our consumers and all that jazz. It's very interactive and it's much more intimate, you know? Yeah, I think after 2020, we kind of got disconnected and, and having communities come back and play TCGs and stuff is really, you know, something I look forward to in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's why I don't worry too much about it. I just, I just care more about play the game. Just play the game. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So here's the thing. Aside from people going to collectahobby.com, I had to throw in another plug there <laughs> where you could actually mm -hmm. talk about your trading card game, show pictures that are trading card game. Yeah. Aside from that, <laughs> do you have any other social media that people could actually follow you to learn more about your Kaishi or anything new upcoming sets or things in the past, any information, where could they go to reach you? Yes. Yeah, so I do have a discord server for the game and it is, Yokaishi TCG official server. You know, I have an Instagram, same thing, Yokaishi TCG. Uh, YouTube, same thing. I try to keep it professional. So, same name across the board, Yokaishi TCG on Instagram, YouTube, DeviantArt, Discord. Those are my platforms of choice right now. Yeah. Wow, like, all right. Well, man, it's been. A good podcast i don't want to end it but i know that that's that's the time limit that we have on the podcast unfortunately mm. i was definitely having fun i will say this is probably the most fun for a podcast or one of the most fun that i had so i just want to thank you so much for joining us now before we go is there anything that you want to close out with any closing remarks between you or rich uh let's see this was a blast i also enjoyed my time here um I don't always get to pop on a podcast. I've only done like one other podcast before. <laughs> this was great. Um, I will definitely hop on again if you if you need me. <laughs> awesome. Rich, do you have anything? Just uh, thank you for coming, Steph. It was a lot of fun. It was great hearing your perspective of the TTG. And uh, before we log off, one more thing, Steph. I want a one of one Pumpkin King holographic card. So <laughs> I'll be I'll be looking out for that, okay? <laughs> I mean, hey, you know what? I could just make that just for you. It'll be an inside joke. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, so I think that was a great episode, guys. Thank you so much. And also, Steph, if you do have a new set that's coming out in the future or you're ready to release a new set, definitely come back. You're more than welcome to come back. We would love to hear about it and for you to introduce the new set to everyone else on this podcast. Oh, yes. That, that sounds awesome. Definitely. You will be hearing from me in the future. <laughs> Hope everyone out there enjoy this special podcast. We'll talk to you later. See you. You've been listening to the Collect a Hobby podcast. Hector and Rich have been collecting video games as well as trading card games for years. And they're up to date on everything that has to do with the hobby. 
For everything you can imagine and need, hit the website at collectahobby.com. You'll find the blog, show and tell, the vault, the forums, and so much more. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll see you next time on the Collect a Hobby Podcast.